Ladies and gentlemen, we are live on Material Issues, episode number 55. I'm Mark Hirschberger, along with my host from the West Coast, Mr. David Bash of the International Pop Overthrow Festival. David, how the heck are you feeling on this Wednesday afternoon in L.A.? Hi, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm feeling well. Um, it's... Uh... Just as you said, it's really hot back east. It's pretty hot out here, too. We're going through kind of a, a heat snap of 95 and up. Yeah. Uh, but unlike the east, it's pretty dry. So it's, you know, it's not that you can't sweat because you can, but not nearly as oppressive. And, you know, we're used to that out here. So you know, I'll tell I've you what, it's really been a great, uh, it's really been a great, Last month or two of album releases. I know you got you got all kinds of stuff in the UK from IPO uh, Liverpool. I did, yeah. Uh, I, I've been getting tons of things in. Of course, we know how much I love Pogo Pops and that new album that just came out from uh, from those guys. But my gosh, the the amount of quality releases over the last couple of months has been mind boggling. So for all, we always say that for all those people who think there's no good uh, rock and roll or pop or power pop being made anymore. That's bullshit. That's total bullshit. And oh. one of the few silver linings of COVID is that it, it enabled artists who otherwise might have been too busy doing other things like playing. <laughs> uh, it enabled, <laughs> it, it afforded them the time to record. And because of that, there's been a lot of great stuff. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I'm I, tons of stuff in the UK and I'm still getting a lot of cool stuff in the mail. And by the way, I did order that Pogo Pops. Uh, LP and CD. Man, so, I can't say enough about it. You know, you know how big of a fan I am of uh, Frank Hammersland. I think he's one of the greatest unknown songwriters of our time. And uh, everything he's done from Pogo Pops to Popium to his solo work back to Pogo Pops again has just been amazing. And, th and this new, very personal album from uh -huh. the Pogo, Pogo Pops, uh, it just go get it. If you guys haven't found it, it's Apollon records.no out of norway just a little plug right there for my buddy i don't friend. know why mark but every time i hear the name frank hammersland i think of that that one time character on the flintstones dr draculab <laughs> who of course had the uh uh bella lugosi voice yeah. but uh, i don't know why hammersland Drac whatever my mind goes into weird places we both do we both do <laughs> yeah that, that that that's for sure <laughs> um <laughs> good yeah, stuff. So anyway so i'm working on you know ipola is, is set i'm working on san francisco and vancouver looking forward to those i'll be sending invites out to uh ipo arlington texas wow. uh, we'll be back again thank you spider pop people for helping us to, you know with that sponsoring us it uh it, so it's it you know we've uh We've got lots of stuff going on. Um, and the IPO CD, I got, uh, I finally sent off the tracks to my mastering person, uh, Alan Brownstein. And it's great. 68 tracks. Wow. We actually had, uh, we actually had a 69th, but didn't have room for it. We're really like up to the, <laughs> we really pushed it time-wise for the three discs. <laughs> But lots and lots of great stuff. And I don't know if anyone who's on the comp is listening, but I want to thank everybody so much for for their contributions. It's going to be a great CD. And it's going to have different packaging this year, by the way. Yeah. We uh, since, uh, since Volume 5, we used a slim 3D case, uh, 3CD case, rather. And, and it was great. But over the years, oh, thank, thank you, you, Brian. Um, over the years, for whatever reason, the quality control on those cases has deteriorated. And with that, the, the teeth that hold the CDs, they become more and more brittle. So yeah. constantly we're, we're getting people complaining that the teeth have broken and the CDs don't stay in place. Um, I know Ray from Cool Cat complained, had a lot of customers who complained about that. Um, but that's all solved now because we're going to be using a, a, a commercially released three CD digipack. Nice. And the teeth are really sturdy. 
<laughs> and it's going to be a nice, a nicer looking package in general. Sure it is. Sure it is. Look, looking forward, looking forward to that. Steve Stanley's working on the artwork, and uh, yes, yeah, so it's oh. all in motion. We're you know planning on having it ready for IPOLA July fourteenth. It'll be unveiled and given away to everybody who comes to IPOLA, as well as probably IPO San Francisco and Vancouver. But nice. we, don't know, we don't know yet. Depends on how many we give away in L.A. So that's all happening, and it's all very exciting. Um, but speaking of exciting, I'm very excited to have the guest that we have. Um, he's uh, he's definitely a man who wears a lot of hats. I just wear the one, but um, but he wears a lot of figurative hats. He's a writer. He's, he's a uh, he's been a political consultant. He's a musician. He's a publisher. He's, he's been an editor. He's done all kinds of stuff. Um, he's now the publisher of one of my favorite sites to read about music, and I'm honored to contribute to it, rockandrollglobe.com. And his band, The Circles, or just Circles, I should say, uh, played IPO in Liverpool a uh, la- uh, couple of weeks ago when we were there. And, you know, he, his, his uh, place in music history is very secure. And we'll be talking about that and other things. But without further ado, I'd like to give a huge material issues welcome to Mr. Ken Curson. And there he is. Yeah. Welcome, Ken. Welcome to Material Issues. Nice to have you here, my friend. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about how how great must your life be going if the teeth on the CD holder is the worst thing you, that's going, that's happening. Well, to be honest, there are worse things. I just prefer not to speak of them. That, 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 that was an life. issue. People, that was a material issue with uh, with our CDs. People were complaining. And I, I, I often wondered why were there not commercial releases with that really thin uh, CD package? And now I know why, because nobody wanted the teeth problem. So now we're using a, di- now we're using a dig- uh, commercially released DigiPack with very solid teeth. So we won't have any of that. Yeah, that could be your tagline. Something yeah, well, about uh, solid you know, I, teeth. I, I, I don't want to be too much of a fanboy here, but I, I think I can I, I can credibly say, as someone who's played at what five different IPOs in three different cities and bought the cds and promoted this thing i'm, I'm just like a huge fan it's I, I i'm 53 years old and it's it's okay. hard for me to to reconcile the fact that i'm still so goddamn excited to uh when i get the chance to go on the stage at the cavern or or even pianos in you know in new york city so um i'm just a, a huge fan of what you've built david I, i've said that in a bunch of different forums at a bunch of different times and I think my approval is usually like a counter endorsement. Like people want to avoid anything I like, but um, in this case, I'm just crazy about what what you and Rena have built. Now, Ken, have you played have you played IPO Liverpool before? Yes, uh, David and I met cute. Um, you know, I I had uh, I had sort of heard of IPO, but um, it, mainly because of its connection to the band Material Issue, which, which I think you know I'm, I'm you know, uh, very close to them personally, but also a huge fan of. So I kind of had this awareness of the power pop thing going on, but I didn't really think through uh, you know, any connection I might have to it. And in, I stopped playing music after the, I left Chicago and I left the Lilacs in uh, 1993. So I just completely stopped playing music. But then, like, you know, uh, my my whole life uh, got turned upside down. And um, uh, I thought, you know what? I'm going to start changing a lot of things and uh, starting to say yes to some things I've said no to, including the many, many times I've been asked to do reunion gigs with either Green or the Lilacs. Um, and so I started to think music should be a part of my life again. And I saw right at the time I was having that that sort of revelation in spring 2017, I saw that I was, I was dating this this lady who was uh, from England. I was starting to get excited about England and UK stuff. And I, and I saw that IPO was going to be in, in Liverpool at the Cavern. And so I, I I reached out to to Bash and I said, look, you don't know me. I don't know you. But I'm, you know, if there's any way I could just go on the stage and play a song or two just between bands while they set up, I, I'm there. And he said, 
yeah, okay. <laughs> and so I did. And, and, and that band uh, that who I got on uh, to go on stage while they were setting up is uh, B-Side, who turned out to have one of the greatest pop songs I've ever heard. That I, I want to give them a plug. Um, run to yeah. Spotify to listen to The Sun Brings Out the Girls, um, <laughs> which is, you know, like a, a, a smiley smile era Beach Boys hit. Um, right. And it's to me, just, it actually sounds much more like Beach Boys Love You because they use that that, as they like to call it, that farty synth sound. <laughs> yeah, and and those low, I guess you know, imitation tubas or something, right? It's probably yeah. synthesizer, but um, but the harmonies are just spot on, and you know, like I started playing my stupid dopey songs, and they were setting up, and they just played along. It was one of those great Liverpool moments. And after that happened, I was just like wholly bought in. And I, I really felt the, you know, the, I, I mean, this, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I, feel, I really felt the, the redemptive hand of God at work there. I just, you know, I'm, I, I'm such a, a music fan, but I, I, and that never changed. I never took a break from loving music, but I think I had sort of let myself forget how important music was to like my soul, if I can just be a little corny and, yeah. and that, it all came flooding back. So and uh, and so so when you finished your set and you watched some ba bands when you walked out onto Matthew Street from the Cavern to take a break, and you noticed and you realized where you just played, and where you're standing, isn't that? I mean, the first time I was there, just helping David with a bunch of things, that that moment for me just still sends chills up my spine. Just just thinking of the location and everything that went on there in the past and what was going on. At the moment, uh, for me, it was just uh, it was transcendence uh, uh, personified, right? You know, it, they're amazing, amazing time. Amazing I'm right time. there with you, Mark. I, I remember after that that first uh, you know couple songs, I went out to have a cigarette with the B side guys, and climbing up those stairs, I, I, I've I, I mean, it's almost like uh, you know a scene from a movie where you feel like you walk out and it's. It's 1962 and you're, you know, you're wearing your Beetle boots or something. And, you know, I, it's such a powerful feeling. I've tried to express this to like everyone I play music with. And since then have brought over the lilacs. We had an amazing show. Uh, and then this year I played with my high school band circles and we just had the greatest time. We actually sounded amazing. And uh, the crowd was, was into it. And, you know, the music holds up and, um, it's it's just such a special place, and I, I you know I, I don't know how to say it other than get there if you can because I'm I live in constant fear, especially during COVID, that you know everything that's that's wonderful and nice about the world is just going to disappear. I'm, I'm really much more of a Kinks fan than a Beatles fan by by a factor of a thousand, and my worldview is very similar to that articulated in the Village Green Preservation Society. That just like. I think everything that used to be is awesome and everything that's coming is terrible. And <laughs> I, I guess that's the, you know, what my heart is. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It, it I, really I, yeah. is surreal. I mean, I, I keep trying to tell bands who I invite just how amazing it is and you can't convey it in words. They, they have to be there. And once they are, they, they get exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you what, not only bands, but fans of the music, uh, fans of the genre, fans of anything. I mean, just to take to take a week's vacation. Tell you, it, it is worth taking a week's vacation during IPO Liverpool to get over there, be a part of the whole scene, be a part of everything in Liverpool, and so close to Manchester, and hop a train uh, to other places. Um, it's just a fantastic week, all highlighted by IPO Liverpool at the Cavern. So, I mean, David's been doing it for a long time, but. You know, uh, yeah, seriously, seriously. So, Ken, yeah. how did so how did you get into the music? Did you have a music education from your from your parents? Um, was it friends? Was it just on your own? No, my my music education started with my brother. My brother's a talented piano player and a, a huge music fan. But my brother, who who's become a, a, a very famous and very excellent writer of uh, nonfiction bestsellers, he's kind of a shy person and. So even though he's six years older than I am, he, you know, he would play piano and make me sing, right? So he, he would teach me to sing and he would sing harmonies. But even, you know, when he's 11 and I'm five, we're singing Benny and the Jets and, uh, you know, um, uh, 
uh, squeeze box was one of our <laughs> one of our hits. I guess I was probably seven when that came out, seven or eight. I'm born in 1968, so I'm trying to do the the math on the who. Seven, yeah. Um, seven. But uh, uh, you know, my 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 earliest musical experiences were 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 my brother playing piano and and me singing. And from this, this really says something about uh, my my shallowness and my my outrageous self regard. <laughs> But I saw myself even then as kind of the front man, <laughs> like, like, you know, I, I wanted to be a good singer and I certainly want to learn music. But I, I was very concerned with our presentation, even though we're sitting by ourselves in our, our living room. Right. So <laughs> that's kind of a, a contrast as, as I discuss this with you guys now. It, it, it's still it's still essentially true about uh, my brother Robert and, and me. <laughs> um, but, you know, from then I, you know, I started to get much more serious about, about making music. And, uh, I, I, I play a really wide variety of instruments. I, I can play a little bit of just about anything and I'm not, not well, I, I really am not being modest when I say I'm not good at any instrument, but I, I do have a certain understanding of how music works and how chords are built and how, how harmony is built on top of melodies and things like that. And so in high school, when I started to get real serious about it, not just as a, you know, a passion and a hobby, but thinking like, this is something I want to pursue. I kind of realized that, you know, the, the guys around me were, were getting ready to pursue, you know, more traditional paths. And even though they love music too, and we loved each other and are still best friends to this day, I started to think like, oh man, I guess I'm just going to have to grow up. And then a miracle <laughs> happened in, in the summer of 1986. I'm 17 years old. I graduated uh, high school. Um, I got a phone call while I was on vacation with my girlfriend from the, the legendary and genius guitar player, singer, songwriter of Green, which remains one of my, my favorite bands of all time. And uh, that's something I share with uh, the, your namesake for your festival, David, uh, uh, Jim Ellison was actually in green for uh, a few months. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he okay. was. And I'll, I'll give you another uh, tidbit for Material Issue fans out there is that Material Issue used to perform the green song, If You Love Me, uh, quite regularly. And, and if I was in the audience, they'd always bring me on stage to sing it with them. Wow. Um, cool. But, so, you know, Jeff called me and said, hey, look, our drummer and our bass player just quit. I, I had heard you were interested in trying out. Do you want to try out? And I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, to me, that was like if Paul Weller had called, you know, it was, it wow. was an obvious <laughs> no brainer. It wasn't really like something I had to think about um, in terms of my lifestyle. So for the next four years, I, you know, I was a professional musician and uh, all of my friends, I, I think literally almost a hundred percent of my high school graduating class and certainly everybody I knew and hung out with went to college and, and I didn't. Um, I, I, you know, I, toured all over the United States and Canada and Europe and played the festival circuit. And Green had a certain modest amount of success and a ton of credibility in the, in the indie rock world, but, you know, sort of could never have that, that hit that would have been life-changing. Right. right yeah. yeah. They definitely should have been bigger, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many factors that go into that as we all know. Yep. Were you on, <laughs> were you on the, uh, on the REM EP? Yeah, I sure was. And a uh, thrill of a lifetime was when Peter Buck, uh, you know, was photographed holding the green REM uh, uh, single. Thanks for recalling that. Those, that's uh, the song. My tears are dry. Circle sometimes plays to this day. I, I think. Oh, wow. Songwriting and singing are just I mean, even at this point, he's, he's I think he's 60 years old. He's still just a phenomenal singer and a great songwriter who's still creating great songs. Um, but uh, yeah, the green at the peak of its powers was was very very special. For people who don't know, I mean, if you haven't figured it out, REM released an album in 1988 called Green, and uh, so I guess Green decided to pay them back a favor and they named their EP REM. But it was, <laughs> whose idea was that? <laughs> that was as with every single idea Green ever had. That was Jeff's idea, our okay. our leader. Um, and you might also recall that Kurt Loder featured us on MTV News, which was like the thrill. I can't even explain to you. I, there, there somewhere exists. I'm sure if you go to YouTube and search, you're probably oh, well. watching this on YouTube right now. But if you search like Kurt Loder and Green, and I mean, Green was founded before the internet uh, was widely in use. So we didn't understand how hard it would be to search such a, <laughs> a non specific right. term. 
But Kurt Loder mentioned the whole green thing. And like I said, Peter Buck uh, came into Pravda Records one time and uh, was photographed holding it. So that was a thrill. That's cool. That's so awesome. what happens after green? Um, I know you formed the lilacs pretty quickly afterwards, right? Yeah. And David, I want to point out how, how endearing I find your pronunciation of lilacs with the, the A being like, like a short O. You, you, you pronounce it as lilacs. I think, I yeah. think people in New York pronounced it that way. That's Maybe. how I heard it. Yeah, it could um, be. It was lilacs. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. Right. No, you do you, man. You, you know, I, you, you just keep bringing it. <laughs> yeah. So when you know when I when it was time to leave Green after four years and really you know just a ton of frustration and feeling like we weren't going to get the you know the massive acclaim. You know, by indie band standards, we we're doing really well. We had a, a a record contract with a sort of minor major or major minor mega disc. Um, but it just became clear we weren't going to be, you know, Blondie. Um, I, I wanted to go to college. You know, I wanted to start thinking about some alternative um, future that would like, you know, provide a living. I was not, you know, I was not a rich kid. I was living on my own. And um, so, but on the other hand, I still had a ton of songs and a ton of things I want to accomplish in music. So uh, my, my high school friend, Dave Levinsky, and I formed the Lilacs. We recruited John Paquel, uh, my other great high school friend. He was the drummer of Circles and is the drummer of Circles. And then this other guy, Tom Whelan, to be our bass player. And the Lilacs, like, pretty soon started getting, like, some really choice gigs. But we didn't even know what to call ourselves. And Jim Ellison said, uh, hey, no, I'm taking over. Ken, I'm going to tell you how to do this. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm imitating his voice. I'm doing it badly. But uh, Jim... <laughs> you know, Material Issue was starting to become, you know, the power pop band of the Midwest and mm -hmm. through relentless touring and just by being excellent and having a real look and feel to them. So he said, I want, I, I think our name, we were going to name some play on the word glam because that was like an early concept. He said, no, you're going to call yourself the Lilacs. I'm going to produce your first record. Um, I'm going to tell you which songs can go on it. I'm going to come over and tell you which of your songs work. I remember him coming over to my basement on 1948, uh, West Belmont Avenue in Chicago. And I played him my song, Jennifer. And he's like, that's a hit. Keep that. Keep it exactly like it is. And he even made the suggestion of getting Jeff Lesher from Green to sing on it, which which we ended up doing. Um, and then I had a couple other songs that he thought were weak and we kind of ditched them. Uh, and not only did he produce our first record, The Lilacs Love You, he plays on it. Uh, that's his guitar you hear on this uh, one of my songs, It Seems Like Years. Um, and he also sings on it, on, on the worst song on that record, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big Who fan and Small Faces fan. So, so I, you know, their song, My Baby uh, Gives It Away. Yeah. Um, so I, I wrote a song called My Baby Does It For Free. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that was kind of the dumbest song that we recorded. But that's Jim's <laughs> voice all over it. He does all the harmonies. And it's a very material issue-ish, uh, you know, uh, one, five octave, you know, kind of... Um, riff that he's got in there uh, i love it and so so the, so circles the band was your was your high school band right circles was my high school band and I, I, interestingly I wanted, uh, although i said i you know I, i'd quit music from 93 till you know the lilacs reformed in 17 the truth is uh, because Kevin and John from Circles were were my neighbors, we you know we're all we're remained best friends. We moved from Chicago to New Jersey all together, New York that area. Um, but me and John always played music like this whole time, uh, you know, like we'd be the rhythm section on some other band's recording, or we we do a few live shows, you know, not really my certainly not my music and not even always original music, but we always played music like in the basement, so. You know, I, I guess in terms of keeping chop sharp, um, but I had never planned to to play like perform with circles again, um, especially because the Lilacs had this miraculous run um, mm -hmm. in reforming. We we reformed basically to do this show. I, I told you I, I got divorced. It's now you know common knowledge to anyone who reads the New York Times. It was an ugly, messy affair. And, um, you know, I thought I got to change my life around. I've, I'm, I'm fucking things up. I, I gotta, I gotta change my life. And, um, so, you know, saying yes to this sort of longstanding offer to play 
at the the biggest best club in Chicago was a was a big step toward Which that. Which venue was it? Uh, the Cabaret Metro. Um, oh, the Metro. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and you know it was like Saturday night headline and and by the way I'm you know I'm I'm I keep Shabbos now so we can't even play Friday nights which is like a huge uh, problem for rock and roll band, um, uh, <laughs> but um, so all of a sudden that went so well and then we played a few of these IPO gigs and other gigs started to come and uh, we decided to do a record basically just to get a few songs down that were kind of lying around from the old days. Richard Lloyd from television wanted to produce it, who I sort of know through through you know my my writing circles more than music circles. And um, we went to Nashville and recorded it. And then in the unlikeliest thing that's like ever happened to me in my rock and roll career is Rodney Bingenheimer got a hold of it and started playing it like all the time, like every week. And then a couple <laughs> other DJs, to my knowledge, only on uh 20 you know 21 the underground garage i don't i have no confirmed sightings of that being played on any other stations um but it made it in our, our song made it onto the the jet blue and united pack uh that serious wow. makes for for them and you know i started getting royalty checks for the first time since uh, since green and i like i couldn't believe it like um like you know at, at ipo in liverpool people know that song like people you know ask me about it it startles me uh, to this day. Um, Amazing but, Rodney play. Rodney only plays stuff with beautiful young girls in it. So <laughs> that's off to you. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, uh, no, I mean, Rodney Bingenheimer is, you know, a legend to me. He's a, yeah. the gold oh, no, standard. No, no I, I listen to the show yeah. like constantly. And, yeah. you know, to hear my song coming, it was just like that scene in that thing you do where they hear their record on the radio and are running down the street. I mean, I was, ever in any yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've had a lot of really wonderful, unique, sui generous experiences, um, you know, at, at high levels of my, my sort of real life in, in writing and politics, but I, I, there's nothing I wouldn't trade to have written a number one song. And so even, even a whiff of, you know, somebody credible caring about my music was just so, so intoxicating. And a lot of credit to Little Steven and the Underground Garage too, because you know in the power pop community, uh, you know, he's he's done quite a lot to promote uh, a, a lot of bands and a lot of artists. I mean, I'm I'm I, I'm witness to it right here with Pop Detective. He's been a big fan for many years and played a lot of my artists all the time. So uh, uh, between Rodney and and his show on, on Underground or on Sirius XM now in the Underground Garage, it's been. Uh, been really great for the power pop community yeah yeah awesome. yeah awesome so ken tell us about so you moved to you said you moved to new jersey with your band buddies but you had you aspired to be a journalist um you didn't have a degree as you as you alluded to earlier uh what made you decide you wanted to do it and you know what made you think you would be able to break in well uh you know, unjustified self-confidence has is, is always sort of been my secret sauce. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when I even when I was in green, you know, I, I really loved to write all the time and all, you know, all day, every day. Um, I, I wrote some of my first articles were for this publication by a, a, a Chicago guy. You write at home on your show called Pat Daly. He used to do this great fanzine called Empire Monthly. He's, he's just like you guys with, you know, tons of records and knows everything and knows everybody. Um, but, you know, I I. I wrote these really long stories for, for his zine. And then when I, I did temporarily enroll in college, I immediately got a, a column about rock music at the, at the school newspaper. So I just, you know, I had the bug that I'm like, you know, I can do this and I'm good at it. And I'm curious and I'm, I'm kind of uh, unafraid to confront people. And those are good traits for, for journalists. Um, you know, it's a <laughs> yeah. job where you gotta be really comfortable with people hating you. And, and I, I've been really unpopular like my entire existence. And that, <laughs> that's an okay place for me. Um, so uh, I, I got the sense I wanna be a journalist. And my, my then girlfriend had kind of gotten sick of me and moved to New York. Uh, and I was like, you know, I'm just gonna like see if she'll kind of take me back and let me live on her couch and uh, you know, we, you know, I could just try and become a journalist, like however that's done. So, so that's what I did. And I, you know, I winded up being married to her for 19 years. Um, uh, but you know, I, I'd write anything. I, I'd write bridge columns. Um, 
a ton of obituaries, which has remained like a big piece of my brand. And in fact, I was going to tell you this story. Um, the, the lilacs, this sort of, you know, little renaissance of, of interest in us, our bass player uh, died um, a few weeks ago. And wow. it was just shocking. Yeah, I did, I did read that. Yeah. 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 So you might have read it on Rock and Roll Globe because um, I wrote an obituary of him. And it's it's kind of my thing. I, I write these, uh, you know, I, I just my again with the kinks like Robio, my, my whole feeling is that life is just like, um, you know, this horrible eye blink of misery. And then it's just gone and nobody even knows you existed and, and stuff. So, I, you know, I, it's important to me to, to commemorate uh, the people that are, are meaningful to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I thought I could, I could become a journalist for, you know, for a living and, and I have, and, uh, you know, thank God, uh, that's been a lucrative and really meaningful and fulfilling career path for me. You were with Rolling Stone for a bit, right? Uh, you know, I never officially worked there, David. I was a fact checker at Rolling Stone, uh, which is more of a consultant basis. But yeah, that, that's one of my first paid gigs of any kind. And just walking in there, um, I, the first thing I checked was uh, um, uh, a, a quick puff piece on Creed, who had were just breaking then. Yeah, and uh, I I don't know if she'd be okay with me saying her name, so I I, I won't because she's still sort of a you know a great rock and roll writer. But um, you know when I called her to check, Jan Winter's thing was that you had to be like. You had to check everything. If if it said John Lennon, you had to look up the word Lennon, and not only write down the page number that you had looked it up, but draw lines through each of the letters to prove you had like looked it up. Wow! wow. So you could never say, "I know how to spell Lennon." You had <laughs> to get it right. So when I called her, I was so, super nervous. Um, and you know what? I can tell you, it, it was Lorraine Alley. <laughs> it's not a big deal. She's not going to care. She's an amazing writer and a, a, a brilliant fan of pop music but i called her to and i was like hello ms ali i want to ask you about creed she's like those were the stupidest motherfuckers i ever talked to <laughs> i've talked to a lot of ridiculous rock stars these guys are such morons like she just and it was it blew my mind to hear like uh, how how regular she was and how you know her assessment of a band like that i'm like you're allowed to speak like that i can't believe it <laughs> Yeah, I think fact checkers are a thing of the past. If you read stuff online and uh, rockandrollglobe.com being a prime exception. <laughs> but if you read stuff online, it's like nobody spells anything correctly. Punctuation is completely, yeah, it, it, it's an archaic thing now. No, uh, it's, it's really it's awful. crazy how, how low the standards are. But I don't blame yeah. the publications, man. I blame the readers who, who just, you know, won't support them in any meaningful way. And you can throw in some blame to to uh, Google and Facebook, who you know who eat up ninety percent of the revenue uh, and don't give them back. I mean, to me, those are thieves. Um, you know, they, they put they take our headlines and uh, the first paragraph of our story, and then and they don't pay us for them. So, and in line with your with the self confidence, um, you named <laughs> one of your publications the Kenny Quarterly. <laughs> and uh, that, okay, so that one is I'm not quite as guilty of, of out of control egotism there. I, I'm believe me, my, my narcissism knows no bounds, but that that's not really an example. That was more of an inside joke. So oh, okay. I, I started to realize I was I love personal finance and was really good at explaining it because my co-workers at uh, where I worked then United Media would ask me, you know, oh, what's this thing I heard about called a 401k? And I just had a real knack for explaining it. And I was answering the same question over and over and over. So sort of as a frequently asked questions, I put I put a bunch of them together and called it the Kenny Curly. It was a total joke. I was not planning. That was not a commercially viable thing. But okay. again, my, my you know, one of my two lifelong partners in crime, John Peckell, is like, no, we got to professionalize this, man. We got we to do something with this. And he was right because people were putting us on TV like right away. That thing became really big really fast we changed the name to green in, in uh in homage right. to our favorite band mm -hmm. and because it's a great name for a money publication um true and true enough yep. and uh and that became really really big really fast i was on cnn uh fn every week for five years wow and, uh yeah and um we got a book deal out of it and uh we sold it to a publicly traded company for you know over a million bucks so that mm -hmm. was that was a, a big win for us. And 
You know, I was just thinking the other day, I really still love talking about and explaining and thinking about money. And I don't know if it's because I'm self-conscious as like a Jew that I, <laughs> I feel like, like I have to somehow disguise that or something. It's, it's pretty twisted and I should probably talk to my therapist tomorrow about it. But um, <laughs> I, I really do love talking about money and I love money just in general. And I, obviously that's, that's uh, such a truism that it seems stupid to say, but I don't just mean the mass accumulation of it. I like that as well. But I love thinking about money. Like I've been a coin collector like my entire life. And, and I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, collector I of other currencies too. You know, so even valueless ones. I just love the look and feel and the symbolism of, of money. And um, I, th I think I'm going to find try and find some avenue to uh, to write about it. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> So you're bringing some news here on material issues. Oh, you, <laughs> you know, Ken, I had a really nice coin collection in, in the late 70s. I had 20 cent pieces. I had, you know, some, you know, a BU Morgan dollars. I had, I had, I had a lot of stuff. And we had this one housekeeper for two weeks. And she was, oh, like, no. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. She was this really nice lady or, or seemed to be. And then two weeks into it, she said, I, you know, I, I found another job closer to my home, so I, I have to quit. A um, couple of days late, and I even drove her to the bus station because I liked her. And then a couple, of, a couple of days later, I go into my drawer to pull out my coin collection. And this one notebook that had my best coins gone, completely gone. So half my collection was gone, and I was so dismayed, I sold the other half. I said, there's no way I'm ever going to get. That's my bad coin memory. But I agree with you. I love story, coin but I am not willing to conclude based on that scant evidence uh, <laughs> that she is guilty. You know, I, uh, they say that uh, show me a conservative who's been arrested, and I'll show you a liberal. And I am, I, you know, I, I'm glad <laughs> to be on the record for many, many years before I was ever arrested as a criminal justice reformer. I'm, I like. You have not convicted her in, in Kenny's court by any, by any <laughs> but it is it a sad story. It might not have been her, but it all, it all, you know, I mean, it's circumstantial, of course. And uh, <laughs> I, I did have a friend who was capable of that kind of thievery. So, you know, <laughs> but uh, I'm like a friend know. for this crime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's just, I, I'm just, I've always been so bummed that uh, that they were gone. Well, here's a quick question for you, Ken. You're talking about, you know, collections. You know, David and I always talk about uh, the psychology of collecting. And you know, obviously we collect a lot of music, yep. as you probably do. Uh, and, and tons of baseball cards. In my and case. baseball cards and things and like that. And pens. Here's one of my Mont Blancs. I uh, really treasure the Mont Blanc is my favorite pen company by far. Oh, mine too, David. Yeah. What what are you showing at me, Mark? It's, I can't it, read. It, it, it's it's uh, a, a retro new white Mont Blanc. No, I can see David's. What is Mark showing me? Oh, okay. This is called Retro Fifty One. It's a it's a neat it's a neat uh, pen company that does all this fifties uh, and sixties themed uh, uh, pens, and they're they're super nice quality uh, in wonderful packaging. But David and I were just talking about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. With our pen collections as well and this is my latest well i, I am uh as you guys saw pre-show i am wearing shorts and my my legs look like some combination of like olive oil and the michelin man so i can't walk <laughs> over but i would show you my pens as well i have, I have some very nice pens oh i have no doubt I was say, what, what 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 do you collect uh just real quick uh, as we talk about music and everything you have anything a little different uh, besides coins and uh you know i i i don't really uh, first of all i I didn't really have money until fairly late in my, you know, I'm not, look, I'm not complaining. I, I, I do well and I've got everything I need. Thank God. But I got five kids now and they're all headed to college. So I haven't had all that, I'm done with that. ability to, to, you know, indulge my, my sort of collecting impulse, but, but I do collect coins. Um, and uh, I also have a, a decent amount of, of cool things. I don't really have a massive, music collection a physical music collection I, you know i probably have three or four hundred lps which uh you know most people who aren't into music think is a huge collection but compared to what you guys have it's it's, it's obviously not uh <laughs> dave the guitar player for the lilacs has you know like a you know the, the the great wall of stuff and and better than most people who just use it for an instagram shot he you know he really listens to it and plays it all the time i love lps i play play them every day 
Um, but I, I don't really have a massive collection. Um, oh, I'm just getting a, a, an IM saying, or a text saying I collect art. And that's true. There are certain artists I, I collect. So one of your, one of your viewers here is, is texting me, um, that I, I do collect art. There's a couple artists, uh, including Ivan Brunetti, um, Tony Fitzpatrick, if you know him, uh, I have a couple of Raymond Pettibone, which are really precious to me. Um, so there's a few artists I, I collect a little bit too. Oh, cool. I just, I, I like to ask that question sometimes because we, we've gotten some cool answers on different things that people, uh, people collect and, uh, and why you collect it, uh, obviously it makes you feel good. And, uh, David and I have gone down that rabbit hole, many discussions. Oh my God. Yeah. Why are we doing it? <laughs> let's, let's get, let's get back. Let's get back to you. Uh, how did you, how did you get, how did you get connected with Rudy Giuliani and end up working, working with him? Yeah. So I, I wrote my first book, which was about green magazine. It was, you know, kind of like a, a, a you know, finance book for young people. And from that, I got hired to do my first co-writing book. So I don't know if there's any fans of CNBC out there, but there's a guy who's still to this day an anchor on the show called David Faber. So yeah. he, he and I co-wrote a book called The Faber Report, and uh, and it did well. And, and it, I got a reputation as someone, you know, you could write a book with. And so Rudy, who in 2000 was was really not, uh, you know, he's had such a, a, a long and varied career filled with like stuff stellar highs and stunning lows. And, and it looks like I'm on my way to imitating that path. Um, although, you know, with, with lower highs and probably lower lows. Um, uh, so Rudy had signed this book, Tina Brown and, you know, the, the, the disgraced Harvey Weinstein signed Rudy to do this book. Um, two books actually about, you know, one was supposed to be his serious memoir. I was born in this year. I married this person. And then this other, that was kind of a, a lighter Rudy's rules management. So they hired the great, uh, um, the Dean of co-writing, uh, this guy Novak, who's actually the, the you know, the, the actor BJ Novak mm -hmm. who plays Ryan on the office and is a great actor and writer. So his dad, um, William Novak, is the dean of co-writers. He co-wrote Lee Iacocca's book, which is like the you know the first huge oh um, yeah I remember alpha male and here's how to be like me type book. So Rudy hired Novak to do the big serious book, but they couldn't find anyone they liked to do like the lighter touch book. So Tina sent six people in to see him. He hated them all. Then she had another group of six, and it, this is awful. It was like we were all sitting in a room together, getting called in one by one. It was it was it was humiliating and, and terrifying. And Rudy and I just connected. You know, just had like a meeting of the minds, um, you know. And later, later on, I, I found out what he liked about me is that all these other guys were like, you know, fifty-five years old and very highly accomplished. And they said, "This will be easy for you, sir. I, I will interview you for two hours once a week, and then I'll come back and you can approve the drafts." And I was like, "Oh man, you're the mayor. I want to hang out with you all the time." <laughs> My, my whole approach was, you know, very much in keeping with my personality. I just, I, I you know, I want to be with the person 24 seven and follow them around and hear how they think and have full access to everything going on. And that was just a much better fit for Rudy. But then, uh, you know, we're working on that for six or eight months and then 9-11 happened. And um, all of a sudden, the only people who could be there, you know, had to have clearance and all kinds of other trusted things. And I became the only journalist like in the world, you know, in the room with, you know, Helmut Kohl or whoever, wow. all these world leaders, Tony Blair or whatever. And uh, the, our book took on a very different, it was supposed to be this very cute little light uh, read and it turned into the, the serious, heavy, you know, leadership. And, you know, Baruch Hashem had, uh, hit the bestseller list for 25 weeks and, you know, bought me my second house. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely proud of that book, uh, and I, I think it holds up. Um, but more than that, it you know, it, it kind of cemented in my head what my you know my political values were and and where I was at um, because I wasn't really active in politics. I you know, I, I to, if I had thought about it, I would have said, yeah, I guess I'm a Republican, but I, not really. I um, but that kind of made me confront you know who I am and make those decisions like you know part of growing up. Tell us, tell us something about Rudy Giuliani that the general public doesn't know. 
All right, I will tell you something about Rudy that the general public doesn't know. What a good question, David. Um, you know, I, I'm actually prepared to answer that because, you know, he's he's undergoing one of these periodic, like everyone in the world hates him phases. And, you know, I, I've, I've been there for both of these. I, you know, I lived in New York when everyone hated him after Amadou Diallo and these other horrible tragedies. And I've been in New York when even the New York Times, you know, was loving him up and saying he should run for president. So these things change. But um, something I will share with you about Rudy um, is that I, I had never been familiar with this habit. So I, my dad was a traveling salesman and I traveled all over the country with him. And, you know, he he was a first of all, we were poor. Um, but secondly, he was this, this very modest living guy. So we always stayed at the Red Roof Inn. In fact, the Red Roof Inn was like a, a high end motel. I love never the, stayed in the hotel, you know, till I was an adult. Um, yeah. You know, we we'd stay in motels that you drive up to, um, you know, and, and believe me, worse than Red Roof Inn. But uh, so I never really confronted this this thing until now I'm traveling the world with Rudy Giuliani, staying in the, the, the fanciest places on earth as all these, you know, Pfizer and Morgan Stanley and all these asshole companies hire him to, you know, give him one hundred twenty five thousand dollars to talk for 45 minutes and say, you know, jokes that I wrote. Um, so <laughs> we're staying in the nicest place on earth. And, and one of my jobs was while he was speaking or doing the dinner, some I had to go up to his room and make sure he hadn't left any secret notes around or, you know, anything. And I kept seeing like two, three hundred dollars on his night table. <laughs> and it it finally dawned on me he was tipping the housekeepers oh, and yeah. that, that concept of tipping the housekeeper i didn't i didn't know people did that did that i didn't um now now i will disclose i do it as well um i don't have 300 bucks to, to, to give but so not only you know it, it it was a combination that he was extremely generous but that he never drew attention to it. And it wasn't like one of these things where like he wants people to know or, or anything. And I, I, you know, I just, I admired the way he did it, not just that he did it. So that's something that people don't generally. Well, know. Full disclosure. I, he was always my hero after the way he cleaned up New York City. Uh, it was, and it was palpable, especially after nine 11, because I hadn't been there since, since 1991. And I saw the difference and, and I attributed a lot of it to him. And I know some people don't, but I, but I, I believe that he, he was instrumental in that. Um, I, I feel really badly for what he's been going through the last few years. It's, uh, I mean, the hero's really taken a fall, and um, I hope he's able to recover from it. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ken, real quick, I wanted to get Gary's question in here. He wanted to know uh, before you started that uh, whether you uh, collect only old, old coins or current collectible coins. Uh, Gary, before I answer that, I got to share with you that my nephew is named Will and, of course, Kirsten. So uh, <laughs> there's a Jets player whose last name is Wilkerson. I, I don't know football that well, but there's a – actually, the head coach of the Jets sits next to me at our country club all the time. And I think wow. the only reason he sits next to me is because I don't I don't give a shit about football, so I don't ask him anything. <laughs> so people are always coming up with, like, their thoughts on who should have started and what play should we call it. It's ridiculous. But there's a there's a guy called Wilkerson who plays on the Jets. So my nephew Will Kerson has his jersey. Um, but to answer your question, I co I collect uh, current collectibles as well, um, and uh, I I am surprised that our our uh, well prepared hosts haven't haven't bored everyone by asking me about this. I'm quite involved with cryptocurrency too. Ah. So that's that's its own form of collecting. I, I served on the board of a company called Ripple for four years. Um, they're, they're a rather large, uh, sort of innovator in the f fintech business. So I'm an early adapter of cryptocurrency. Uh, I don't know if you could call that collecting the same way because it's almost the opposite. I, I like the physical objects, but yeah, I, I, I do. Well, there you go. Well, why do you get that in? Because you know, people like to ask these questions. So uh, tell us about, you know, you, your, your stint with the New York observer and Jared Kushner and just how that all came about. So uh, Jared's family have been my friends since, uh, you know, like 2000. Um, oh, wow. I, I remember meeting his parents, Charlie and Sarah, um, at, at least back in 2001, um, because Rudy knew them. And this guy I worked with in Rudy's office, Bruce Teitelbaum, was a friend of Charlie's um, through sort of, you know, the sort of modern orthodox, you know, everybody knows each other type stuff. 
Um, I hope you guys are hearing this Woody Allen like lightning and thunder because I hear I, the thunder. Yeah. yeah, I'm in Miami, so it's 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 like uh, it's like the the Central Park scene of Manhattan at all times. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so I got I started to get to know Charlie, and, and I was my role in um, in Rudy's world was that because I lived in New Jersey, not New York, like everything in New Jersey was somehow my responsibility. So um, when Charlie started to, to, you know, they started to do some business with, with him, um, you know, I just naturally got to know them. And then uh, they had a, a speaker series at, at Kushner Companies. I brought my mom to a couple of times and, and she, she had fun going to it and loved them as people. And then uh, as sort of seems to happen, so this is very unlucky for you guys, but sort of seems to happen to everyone I love in my life, Charlie got in really bad trouble um, and serious trouble. And I was able to be really helpful, I think, to, to their family. And we we bonded really closely. That time, Jared was a kid. He was like, you know, in, in Harvard undergrad, not just even uh, eventually went to, to law school, but he hadn't even started law school yet. Um, and, uh, you know, we became friends, but I was, you know, I was like a a guy with a wife and a kid and he was a college student. So you don't, you don't have that much in common yet, but we stayed in close touch and he winded up buying, um, uh, a publication called politicker NJ. So it was about New Jersey politics and, you know, that's right up my alley. And, and so, you know, we, we sort of stayed on each other's radar and stayed good friends. We went to the, uh, uh, Republican political convention together in 2008 in uh, Minneapolis. I'm, I'm a little bit of a junkie for political conventions. So I've been to every Democrat and every Republican political convention wow. since 2000. Wow. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, so I stayed in touch and I became a consultant after Rudy's disastrous presidential run. I was the COO of Rudy's campaign and I, you know, I take at least some percentage of the blame uh, for it turning into such a disaster. But um, after that happened, I became a political consultant, you know, as, as sort of everyone who fa fails in politics eventually makes a lot of money to, to do it. It's, it's a crazy business. Um, but, uh, you know, I did, I did have some, some writing skill and some, some eventually some directing skill. So I was making, making spots for, for governors and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Senate candidates and congressmen. And, um, Meanwhile, Jared had bought the New York Observer, which was the sort of small but beloved uh, New York City paper that chronicled like it was like the college newspaper of the Upper East Side was one of the taglines yeah. uh, for it. And I, I loved it. I, I grew up, you know, I, I read it consumptively before, you know, probably before Jared ever even knew about it. And I was friendly with uh, Peter Kaplan, the, the legendary editor of the Observer. And then when Jared bought it, um, you know, I, I gave him advice and my thoughts and he was, he was very welcoming and he would solicit my thoughts on it. And he asked me if I would consider being the editor in chief when, when, uh, it's current editor, then current editor, Elizabeth Spires was leaving. Um, and Elizabeth, who's turned into like one of my, my biggest critics, um, is really just a, a phenomenal, uh, editor and writer as well. Um, so I, you know, I, I really admired what she was doing with the, the paper. Um, but I told Jared, I would love to do that. I, I'm, I hate politics. I, I, I can feel my soul like being killed minute by minute, you know, operating in the world of Republican politics. But the thing is in politics, you wait like three years, you make very little money so that in the presidential years, you could just make a pile of dough. And so this was in the like spring of 2012. He's like, come on, be the editor. I'm like, if you can wait till the end of the year, I'll do it. But I, I can't walk away from what I've been investing four years in. So, so that's how that happened. So from, from late 2012 through uh, 2017, I was the editor in chief of, of the paper. And we, we had an unbelievable run. You know, we built it from uh, 1 million uh, unique users doing 3.1 million page views to about 7 million unique users doing 20 million page views. So that's, you know, 7x growth in five years. And I can't say we matched it with profitability. That That's just, I don't know why. I, I'm I'm struggling with that right now in my, my, my current publishing endeavors, um, which are growing really nicely and performing really well and have excellent traffic. But somehow the ability to make money in publishing is just, has just eluded me. And it's it's really, uh, it's frustrating. Yeah. And through, yeah, I know. 
um, through Jared, obviously you met President Trump and I saw a picture with you and him. Um, how well did you get to know him? And do you know anything, again, like the Giuliani question, is there anything about Donald Trump that we do, that the public doesn't know that we would like to know? Well, that's a harder one for a couple of reasons. We, you know, Trump has been the, the most public person imaginable forever. So um, but I don't know him as well um, as I know Rudy. Um, but but I didn't I knew Trump before uh, before he ran to politics. I, Trump interviewed me when he was considering running in 2012. Um, actually, Maggie Haberman asked me about this um, because there's been there's been some question about how serious he was about running when he sort of you know, thought about it in 12 and we winded up very weakly endorsing that, that, uh, complete weasel Mitt Romney. Um, but, uh, he was serious and he interviewed me and he brought me into Trump tower and, and, you know, some of the, these people whose names are famous now, like Michael Cohn and Rona Graff, um, you know, these were like, uh, the, you know, these characters who I met then. And, um, he might've had, he probably had heard about me through Jared, but, it wasn't like a Jared arranged thing. It was it, it was independent of Jared. And I think, you know, if he would have run in 2012, he probably would have hired me. Um, but then once, yes, once he, once I, I came to the Observer, um, I started to know him a lot better. And uh, like, for example, we ran this, you know, famous at the time story about, uh, uh, this is this is I'm, I'm still annoyed about this, but there there was a, a attorney general of New York State then called Eric Schneiderman, who was um, who was suing Donald Trump uh, for Trump University at this time, calling it a scam, and the Observer ran a really tough piece on Eric Schneiderman, and naturally we were criticized like crazy, you know, for carrying water for for Donald Trump. I, I always thought that criticism was totally unfair and and really based on the fact that I wasn't one of the popular kids, uh, so I wasn't allowed to, you know, to decide what to what to write about and cover. That story was 8,000 words long. Not a single fact in it was ever challenged, including by Schneiderman's incredibly aggressive PR team. And uh, more to the point, um, Schneiderman was later revealed to, like, you know, be choking the shit out of, like, four different girlfriends. Yes. Um, he had to he had to resign from office. But the the point I'm trying to make is that the the criticism and harassment that we got for daring to to criticize this guy is is part of why I you know this stuff wasn't uncovered earlier and and I, I think like in journalism there's such a disgusting uh, incestuous club and if you don't belong to it you have run afoul of of their rules and. You know, like I already told you during this podcast, I'm really, you know, I'm very comfortable with with being hated and and uh, outside the group. And that's that's where I operate. And so, I, you know, I, I stand by that story. And now you now you, you're publishing rock and roll dot com, which has to be a lot of fun for you, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, rock and roll globe dot com is is one of eight uh, publications in our, you know, our little uh, mini empire. Uh, my my partner and I, Kevin Sanders. Uh, now you know I think we're up to twelve employees. Uh, my wife works for the company. We're we're you know we're growing a media company. That's hard to be. You know we're growing independent media company that that does real journalism, and that's really difficult to do. Uh, yesterday was primary day. Um, three of our publications are focused on state public uh, state politics, which is a totally uncovered aspect of the world and it's really important that there be coverage and in two of those states there were primaries yesterday in california and new jersey and i you know i sent our whole team uh, an email this morning telling them how proud i was of the coverage because i i really feel and i, I don't I, I don't care how corny this sounds I, I really feel that this is important work that we're doing uh you know maybe especially so in a state like new jersey which has no tv station no real newspaper now that the star ledger and the the record are you know have been reduced to to like pamphlets um and without us and some of the other um really aggressive uh new media sites out there you know these politicians could get away with murder and that's this is not good for anybody you know maybe you've been listening to the, the great podcast that wnyc has been doing some politicians may have actually gotten away with murder it seems there's, there's been this couple 
that oh, was sure. you know, a, 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 described as a murder suicide. I knew the dad. I know the son. And it's just it's absurd what, what can go on if there's not a free press. Yeah, your New Jersey site's uh, really well done. Uh, I've been reading that for the last week. I've been reading your wine and whiskey site. Oh, thanks, I'm Mark. And both of those. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, rock, rock, and, uh, rock and Roll Globe. Uh, um, I, I check constantly, just like just as David does. Well, All very so. well done. And, it, uh, it's been an honor to write for rockandrollglobe.com. And I've been remiss in not having written anything for a while, but that's going to change now that I'm back home and uh, have my schedule a little bit more uh, organized, I definitely want to contribute some more stuff. So that'll happen. Great. Um, Ken, I just want to say, and both Mark and I, I'm sure, want to say thank you very much for being a guest. It, it, your life has been, you know, nothing short of interesting for sure. And you've had a lot of highs and lows. And despite the fact that you say that you think things might be diminishing, being lower and lower, I hope that's not true. You, you <laughs> You, you, you deserve a good life. You've got a wonderful wife, five kids. You keep Shabbos. Um, <laughs> that's all That's all really good stuff. And I want to thank you for all that you've done. And, you know, uh, full disclosure, Ken has definitely, he's a sp uh, Rock and Roll Globe's a sponsor of IPO. We're very grateful for that. He, you know, you've definitely helped us. And um, just keep on keeping on, really. Thank you yeah. so much, David, and great to meet you, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. I'm dying for a tab now. Uh, I don't know if I can find one. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, look on. <laughs> yeah. This is a, a great program. I, I've listened to it. This is a revelation to me that you can actually watch it. I, I didn't understand that. I, I have it on my podcast app, and uh, yep. so, yeah. uh, I will certainly be checking you guys out uh, visually as well. Excellent. We appreciate well, that. Thank you. Being on here, uh, uh, an absolute pleasure. And we wish you the best and uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, Gary just said, great show. Thank you, Thank Gary. You. Thanks and so much. Everybody else is checking in. So have a great night. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Stay yeah. grateful. And, and say, hi to, say hi to Melody for me, please. Sure will. We'll All be right. in touch Thank soon. You. Thank you, Ken. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that was that was great. Uh, he's there you he's have it, my friend. A very interesting guest. Had a you know had a lot to talk about. Wasn't shy about expounding upon things. Um, sure. And answered everything very professionally. Um, yeah. That, that, Episode uh, yeah, that number really good one. Another very good one. I'll tell you what we had. Uh, we had quite a number of viewers coming in and out and in and out. And yeah, uh, we saw that. Uh, you know, uh, taking an interest in what was going on, which was. Really a very, very, very interesting uh, episode tonight. So, you know, we, we we tend to pull them out like that. People people don't realize that, you know, he Ken had mentioned something in our in our discussion here, how he wanted to he was doing things because he wanted to, you know, remember the past and he wanted to make sure that people don't forget it. And that's kind of like you and I discussed that with material issues when we find some of these artists that we interview on here because they're not heard of from in a long time or nobody's interviewing these people anymore. And we've brought them up here and now it exists in Facebook archives, YouTube archives uh, for everybody to see for as long as, as those platforms exist. So um, I think it's a very cool thing. Yeah. Very look, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud of the guests we've had. Um, I'm sure there will be many more in our future. Um, Again, I, I used the word remiss earlier. I've been somewhat remiss in not aggressively going after guests recently. Uh, you know, IPO, the whole month of May, I, I was gone. And, uh, you know, I could have certainly tried, but whatever whatever time I did have to do work, I had to concentrate on IPO. But now that I'm home, um, we've reached out to a few people waiting to hear back. Uh, yep. Right now, we don't have any scheduled guests, but... You know, as always, irons change. in the fire. Pardon? <laughs> I can change in a heartbeat. That's why it does. I it, tell it can and does. To, uh, join the, the group on uh, Facebook Material Issues or subscribe over at YouTube because we'll let you know a day or two in advance who might be on. So, yeah, you know, it could be one of your favorite people that you've always wanted to hear from live right here Absolutely. on Material Issues. Yeah. It's all good. But anyway, Mark, it was a. Uh, <clears throat> It was a great time as always. Always, always good to see you, and you too, so friend. much fun doing this. You too. So, everybody, have, have a great night. Yeah, we always yeah, say definitely have a great night, and thank you so much for your support. And uh, we hope to see you next week. 
See you back here next Wednesday. Cheers. Cheers.